So Father, we come before you this evening. I dedicate this word and this meeting to you. Lord, tonight your verses are gonna stretch us, no doubt, and um, it's gonna test us. And we welcome that, Father. If there's any error in our lives where we've slid into selfishness, whether it be in our giving financially or whether it be in our sharing and operating in our gifts, whether it be with the love that you have given us, Father, tonight test our hearts and renew a right spirit within us. The same spirit that is in you that gave Jesus freely. You gave your best and you gave it willingly. Lord, may we be more like you by the time these scriptures have been embedded into our hearts. And all, the, all those that agreed said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I think one of the statements I started off by making last week was simply this, and that is the ultimate purpose of our life should be to make a difference and make a godly difference more specifically. That should be the ultimate aim of each and every one of our lives. I mentioned last week that the more isolated we become, the more selfish we become. Everyone's like that, whether you're unsaved or saved. The more isolated become, you become, the more focused you become on your own needs, your own wants, and your own desires. And if you had to ask anybody in the auditorium here tonight, I bet you they will tell you there's seasons in their lives where they've gone through highs with God, where the thing they held loosely to the things of this world, that they were generous people, but likewise, they went through seasons in their life where everything became about them about meeting their needs, about them becoming more comfortable. And I've been there several times in my own life. And that's why messages like this just give us and set us on our true north again to realize what's important. The only work that really counts for anything is the work that will show up in heaven. Say that with me. The only work that really counts for anything is the work that shows up in heaven. Or one could put it this way, the work that lasts forever. If you had to take a look at all the work that you're currently involved in, everything that you're currently doing right now, how much would you honestly say is going to be in your arms when you stand before Jesus on judgment day? And the Lord's gonna take a look at it and say that which you did contributed to your eternity. Or how much of it is gonna be burnt up as a chasing after the wind, to become debt free, to have the home, to have the house, to have the car, to have the medical aid, to have the retirement, to have all of those things. Because let me tell you folks, as nice as what those are, they should not and never be a priority for the believer. Never be a priority for a believer. You are working towards a wage that can only be spent in heaven and will be judged by Jesus on judgment day. And I think that encapsulates the spirit of generosity because everything we do willingly with our heart, the Bible says, is storing up for us treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. I suppose one could say that this message is about legacy. What would your legacy be right now if the Lord had to come and your life had to end? What would you have with you as you appeared before Jesus in heaven? Would you have anything to show for the life that you've lived? Now, I know this is not the ideal Sunday night message, <laughs> but it's going to get better, I promise. It's encouraging. Praise the Lord. The Bible says in Psalm 112, verses 5 and 6, good will come to those who are generous. Isn't that a wonderful promise? Good will come to those who are generous and lend freely. They will be remembered forever. Look at that. One of the things you can be remembered for in heaven, imagine walking down the streets of gold in heaven one day and people pointing and saying, listen, that guy, that guy, CFC, he was generous. That couple over there was so generous. In actual fact, they were so generous, I know they went without so that people could have. Imagine having that testimony. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 25 says, a generous person will prosper. You wanna know what the key to prosperity is? is generosity, is generosity. Now you could flip that verse and you could say that those who do not prosper are never generous. So last week I spoke about my message title was Eternal Rate of Investment, E-R-O-I. And I dealt with intentionality, being intentional in our giving, being intentional in our service and being intentional in soul winning. How many of you remember that? 
So last week was dedicated to becoming more intentional in everything that we do, being more intentionally generous, intentionally generous. Tonight's message, though, is all about generosity, and generosity really is a spirit. Giving and tithing are always controversial topics. Can someone say amen? Oh, you're not convinced. Okay, it's not controversial here. So let me settle this. Pastor Andre, does tithing save me? No. Not in a New York mile. We are saved by grace through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, lest any man should boast. If you think that you can tithe your way into heaven, you at the wrong church. (laughs) You can't tithe your way into heaven just like you can't serve your way into heaven. You have to be saved by grace through faith. And it's through faith falling in love with Jesus, that we choose to obey and to please Him. Let me say this. There is obedience in faith. No question. But remember, God wants your heart and not just your behavior. And this is where people get it all mixed up. They think, I have to tithe. No, you don't have to tithe. You get to tithe. Well, pastor, I have to pray. You don't have to pray. You get to pray. Well, pastor, I have to read my Bible. You don't have to read your Bible. You get to read your Bible. And this church is not about have tos. This church is trying to get you the place of, hey, I get to. We want to teach you the joy that you can find in prayer. Pastor Andre, if I never read my Bible again, will I make it to heaven? Yes, because you are saved by grace through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, lest any man should boast. But let me tell you, You are going to have a torrid time every single day from now on until you make it to the pearly gates. You're going to be broken up, beaten, busted, and disgusted. Why? Because you didn't know the value of the promises that the Bible held for you. Don't stay away from it. Dive into it. Why? So that we can reign in this life and not only in the life to come. We are saved by grace through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. And so many Christians fall into the trap of the law instead of living under grace. My message title this evening is grace giving. Not just giving, it's grace giving. Imagine being married to a husband that says to his wife, well, you know what, I'll be faithful. I'll provide, I'll protect because I have to. I don't give a hoot about you, don't worry. I'm not going anywhere. Because God commands me to be faithful. Who wants to be married to a man like that? No woman wants to be married to a man who tells her, I'll be faithful to you because I'm told to. No, you'd far rather have your husband say, listen, it's because I love you. I honor you. I esteem you. I'm doing it not because the Lord tells me to do it. I'm doing it because I'm in love with you. And grace giving is rooted. Listen to me, folks. Grace giving is rooted, ultimately rooted in love for Jesus. Now this applies to every aspect of our Christian life. Here at CFC, we want, we want you to be, we want you praying, not because you have to, but because you realize that it's fun. Sorry, I'm just distracted. All of a sudden, I've got huge pins and needles in this left arm of mine, and it doesn't want to function. <laughs> Thank you, Father, the healing power of Jesus working in my body. I don't know what's going on. I wonder if it's the microphone that's shocking me. It feels like I've got electricity flowing through my whole body. No jokes, this is weird. I hope that's not on the recording. If it is, edit it out. Okay, so let me make this profound point to get your focus off my left arm. God does not want an external obligation more than he desires an internal motivation. And that internal motivation is the heart of generosity. Go with me to Philippians chapter 2, from verses 2 through 12 and 13. Listen to what it says. Dear friends, you always follow my instructions. So here we go. You followed my rules. You followed my regulations when I was with you. And now that I'm away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. Obeying God. Look at that. Instructions. Obeying God with deep reverence and fear. Now, the first part or the first verse in verse 12 could almost be likened unto the law. And bear with me for a moment. Follow my instructions. Obey God with deep reverence and fear. But look what it goes on to say. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the 
power to do what pleases Him. In this verse, we clearly see a distinct difference between law and grace, or grace and law. One is God giving you the desire to do it. Listen, God doesn't want your obedience. He wants your heart. He doesn't just want your obedience. He wants your heart. And this this verse so beautifully states the difference between an external obligation, obeying, you followed my instructions, you obeyed God with deep reverence and fear, and then focuses on internal motivation, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. How many of you want to get to that point where the commands of God are not burdensome anymore? Amen? They're no longer difficult. And that is all rooted in the revelation of what Philippians is telling us over here. Philippians, over these, in these two verses, is distinguishing the difference between I've got to versus I get to. I got to versus I get to. We live free. Can someone say, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Say this, I'm free to obey. I love to obey. Because God is working in me, both to will and to act according to His good purpose. Do you know there's only two verses in the Bible from what I've studied that actually makes provision for God to regain control of your will? One is found here in Philippians 2 and verse 13. The other one is found in Psalm 35 and verse 13. And it says this, David says, I humbled my will with fasting. Sometimes we lose control of our will and end up wanting to do things that God doesn't want us to do, and we found ourselves bound in that thing. This verse over here brings liberty, and so does Psalm 35 and verse 13, and that's just a caveat to what I'm saying. Maybe somebody needs to know that here tonight. You're struggling with something to be free, and this verse I want you to hold on to. So Philippians 2 over here gives us a clear distinction between you have to tithe, You have to give. You have to love. You have to be generous. You have to serve. You have to do this. I mean, that's terrible. You don't have to do anything. You get to tithe. You get to give. You get to love. You get to serve. You get to do all these things. Can someone say, praise the Lord? Say this, I don't have to. I get to. This is so beautifully explained by Paul, funny enough, as it is in a fundraising campaign verse that I'm going to be reading next. Let's see how Paul approaches this sticky issue of giving and generosity as he addresses this church in Corinth. Now, just so you know, the Jerusalem church was one of the poorest of all the other churches in that time. Yet, every other church that Paul planted in Asia Major and Asia Minor owed a debt to the Jerusalem church. Because if it was not for the Jerusalem church, they would not have existed. So they were all in good times, things were happening, but Jerusalem was in dire need. And Paul really appeals to these churches, specifically Corinth over here, and he tugs on their heartstrings, so to speak, about the spirit of generosity. He uses a church that was another poor church, Macedonia, as an example to create a bit of healthy giving competition between these two churches. Because Corinthian church and the church in Ephesus, they had plenty moolah. They had a lot of money. So let's tackle this verse and see what we glean from this with regards to the spirit of generosity and grace giving. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace. Not the I have to but rather I want to, the grace. We want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Take a look how this grace flows out of their lives. In the midst of very severe trials, their overflowing joy, talk about an oxymoron. Severe trial, overflowing joy. I want to ask you a question tonight. Have you ever met anybody that's got practically nothing in comparison to you, but yet you're puzzled at how joyful they are? Have you ever met anybody like that? I'll never forget one year I was traveling from southern Sudan, Kotido. We were making our way back to Uganda. We had terrible unrest in our spirits about staying in Kotido that night. We really, the, the, the Spirit of God told us to leave. So we're in this place just on the southern border of Sudan, Kutido, and we were making our way back to, back to Uganda. We had to go through a place called um, Lira Town. And just outside Lira Town, we were at, a, we were at an army 
army checkpoint. And I remember sitting in the car back then, and I looked out to my right-hand side, and there was a little Ugandan, a little boy, a little Ugandan orphan. He had found, now I'd been praying the whole way, I wasn't happy, I told Pastor Johnny and Pastor Greg the story. We went to a restaurant, and Peter Wanyama told me, listen, the only thing you should eat here is green banana. Don't eat anything else, you'll die. I promise you, what looked like meat was flies. That's, it was, it was putrid. It was disgusting. It was terrible. And I was thinking, oh, yeah, it was just one, I was having an off day. Let me put it that way. I was having an off day where I wasn't very grateful. I did, we had traveled all the way up there. It took us 16 hours. I preached in two churches, and then we had to travel all the way back again. So I was tired. I was irritable. And I looked out of the car, and there was this little Ugandan orphan sitting in the mud on the ground. He had a mango pip, not a new one, not a fresh mango. He had somehow found a mango pip. The little hairs were even like on it, you know, like it had exploded. And he was sitting there, and he looked up at me, and he was smiling, and he's parting the hairs on the mango pip. And I thought to myself, this kid's got less than nothing, but yet he's got such a big smile on his face. He's in the mud. You can see he's emaciated. He's hungry, and he's got this mango pip. And you know what? He offers it to me. I'm in the car. It's almost like this kid said, listen, you need a bit of, you need a bit of excitement in your life. Take this, take this mango pip. I'll never forget. And this, and this, scripture, this scripture that Paul speaks about over here, he says the Macedonian churches who in the midst of severe trial, their overflowing joy welled up. And it says overflowing, uh, overflowing, sorry, severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity, which tells me generosity has got nothing to do with money. It's got to do with a heart attitude. At that moment, with everything I had, I wasn't content. I was irritable. This little boy had nothing, yet his heart was a million times more generous than mine was at that point in time. I've never, ever forgotten that. Generosity is a heart attitude. Listen to this. I mean, this will blow your mind if you haven't read it in a while. He says, their extreme generosity welled up. He says, for I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Even beyond, look at this, in, this, this you want to underline in your Bible, entirely on their own. Paul says, I didn't go to Corinthians with a flashy slideshow presentation of an orphan in Uganda offering me a mango pip so I could raise money and give it to him. He didn't come with all these little nifty little tricks and little side stories and motivations in order to motivate the Macedonians to give. It says here, entirely on their own. I didn't even need to ask. Look at this. They urgently pleaded with us, Lord Jesus, make us more like the Macedonian church. They pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the Lord's people. I mean, this Macedonian church, albeit small and poor, were in such sync with the heart of God. They said, whatever we've got, we're going to give it because there's someone that needs it more than us. Can someone say praise the Lord? Look what Paul says. He says, and they exceeded our expectations. How is this possible that a people can be so generous when they themselves are facing such adversity? Here is the key. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord. And then by the will of God, also to us. I would dare to say, folks, that only those people that have not given themselves to Jesus first will ever be able to spend, them, them to spend their money on anybody else. We have to give ourselves to the Lord first, and that compels us and drives us. We read further, it says, and so we urge Titus, just, had, just as he had earlier made a beginning early made a beginning to bring also to completion, look at this, this act of grace. Act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, this is what he's speaking to the Corinthian church, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love that we have, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel, not just in giving, but in the grace of giving. Look at this. You want to underline this in your Bible. I am not commanding you. 
Isn't that a fresh perspective? I'm not drawing fancy plans and doing these huge fundraising things and all these initiatives. He says, I'm not commanding you. This is of your own free will. He was almost trusting in the work that the Lord had done in their hearts and that they were a generous people. I'm not commanding you, but I want, I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnest of, earnestness of others. For you know the grace, there it is again, the grace of our Lord Jesus. Now, folks, we know that Jesus didn't do anything because he had to. Everything he did was because he wanted to. And that's what Paul is honing in on over here. That though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And here is my judgment about what is best for you. He's saying, listen, not what's best for Jerusalem, what's best for you in this regard. He says, Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Let me say the roadway to hell is paved with good intentions. Christians are very good at, they're very good at pledges. Hey, Pastor Johnny? I mean, Christians are multi-billionaires in pledges. Pledge this, pledge that. But guess what? Those pledges, he was, he was actually speaking about the pledges that they'd made that they weren't fulfilling. He says, last year, you were the first not only to give, but also have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it. According to your means. There's another thing you want to underline. According to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. So now the question is, Pastor Andre, well, how do I become a grace giver? Well, I've got three brief points that I want to share with you this evening that I want to leave with you. How do I become a grace giver? Well, we become grace givers first and foremost by when we're grateful and we, when we give out of gratitude and not out of guilt. When we give out of gratitude and not out of guilt. Let me say this, people who aren't generous are also not grateful. People who are not generous or not grateful are also not generous. And those who are not generous are not grateful. The two are linked together. Turn with me to 1 Chronicles 29 verses 10 through 14. Let's see how this works. So how do we become grace givers? Number one, when we're grateful and not guilty. When we give because we're grateful and not because we're guilty. Not like, oh, now I have to come and return my 10% to the mafia. Because if I don't return my 10% to the mafia, my fridge is going to break. My car's going to break. Who knows if I'll have a job next month? I don't know. You know, I just don't know. So let me give my 10%, pay the mafia off. God's the mafia boss. And then God's going to be happy with that. No, no, <laughs> no. That's not the way it works. I'm going to be sharing some other scriptures with you that might that might clarify that a bit later on. So we become grace givers when we're grateful and not guilty. 1 Chronicles 29, verses 10 through 14. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly. Let me just say this about David. He wanted to build a temple for God. God said, David, there's too much blood on your hands. You can't build a temple. If I was David, I would have said, dodge that bullet. Okay, Solomon, it's up to you. I would have. I would have said, Lord, I promised you I would. You said I can't, so that's fine. David goes one step further. He says, okay, you said I can't build it, but you didn't say I can't pay for it. And David was the largest giver, which tells me he knew something about God that many of us have yet to learn. He was grateful for what God had given him. And so this is why David praises the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly saying, praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. He's acknowledging that I own nothing. I can take nothing with me. I hold loosely to the things of this world. Will somebody say that with me? Say this, from tonight on, I'm deciding to hold loosely to the things of this world. Keep a very loose grip on the things of this world. Don't let them have you. You can have them, but don't let them have you. And that's what David's saying. Everything in heaven and on earth is yours, Lord. He says, yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things, and your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks, gratitude. See this? 
David's heart was filled with gratitude. We give you thanks and praise your glorious name. He goes on to say, but who am I? And who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? He's saying of everything and all the money we've raised and all the personal wealth I'm going to give you to give to this temple. Who, can, how can I even honestly say that I'm generous when in actual fact you've given me absolutely everything that you are going to give me a reward for giving in the first place? We're talking about a king whose heart was so grateful that he could not even he couldn't understand why God would reward him for giving back to God the very things that God created. And let me say, there is nothing in your bank account, nothing you own, nothing you drive, nothing you wear, nothing you live in that was not given to you by God Almighty himself already. So how on earth can we hold so tightly to the things of this world? We need to hold loosely. We need to be driven by generosity. Father, may the heart of David saturate us. He says, able to give as generously as this. Everything, he says, comes from you. And we have given you only what came from your hand. This verse, these verses over here speak directly to how grateful David's heart was. Can you see, folks, how you can easily draw the distinction between a generous, a grateful heart is a generous heart. It's when we lose sight of what God has done for us that we begin to hold on to the very things that are His. You see, if you're grateful, you can be incredibly generous. So that's the first one. Pastor Andre, how can I excel in grace giving? That's the first one. The second one is when I love people the way God does. Such a beautiful portion of Scripture in Acts chapter 2. I'm going to be reading Acts chapter 2 from verse 42 to 47 and then Acts chapter 4. But just listen to what took place in the New Testament church. I mean, these guys, <laughs> these guys in the New Testament church were just having fun with generosity. They were doing crazy things, things that we read about but very seldom actually do ourselves. These guys were crazy, crazy generous. Why? Because they were so in love with the people of God. And you're going to find out at the end of the scripture that it was all because of their generous spirits that God was adding daily to their number. God was sending people to these group of Christians because they just lived an, a ridiculously generous lifestyle. Listen to this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship of the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had a need. Look at that. I mean, when was the last time you had a budget to go out for dinner, you and your wife, and you said, we're not spending more than 500 rand. You opened the menu and you saw something that you could buy for the two of you for 450 rand and give the wait the waiter or the waitress a, a 50 rand tip and you'd walk out there on budget. When was the last time you said to your wife and you looked across the table, you said, you've got a 500 rand budget. I tell you what, let's only eat 100 rands worth of food each and let's tip our waitress 300 rand. Let's be generous. That's what we're talking about, yeah? I mean, these guys sold houses. They sold cars because the spirit of generosity had so consumed them, they couldn't bear anyone else around them having a need. Lord Jesus, help us. We've got a long way to go. Can someone say, I've got a long way to go? So I double dog dare you. The next time you go out for dinner, maybe it's to the waffler, hint, hint. Maybe it's to the waffler and you've got 500 rand you want to spend, order two coffees, let it come to 50 rand, and give that waitress a 450 rand tip, and see, and just make her day, and just be generous, because the Bible says, generous people will be blessed. That's what the Lord says in His Word. <laughs> Amen. It's one or two people. <laughs> Some people are saying, we're going to the waffle tonight, we're not going anymore. All the believers were together, they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had a need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Look at that. They sold. When have you seen people together giving up houses and cars and still gathering together with sincere hearts and just sharing with everybody? That's how consumed they were with the love of Jesus. Praising God, look at this, and enjoying the favor of all the people. This favor is what generosity produced. 
and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Jesus said, I'm gonna put new people right into the heart of that kind of generosity that people are having. In Acts chapter four, verses 32, it says this, all the believers were in one heart and one mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, listen to this, with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them. Why? Because of the spirit of generosity. It says, all that we, all that were, <laughs> and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to anyone who had need. I mean, come on, talk about the early church having so much fun with generosity. And I wanna say to you as Christian Family Church, we're not expecting you to sell your houses and cars and all that kind of stuff, but we have made this little card, something extra just to show you that God loves you. These are available at our Welcome Center. I'm not asking you to sell a house or sell a car or go bond yourself in order to give a bigger offering so people will have something. But why not just carry some of these in your wallet and give that waitress or that waiter a tip and give them like 100 bucks or 200 bucks with this card that God loves you. How about that? Isn't that a great idea? We should have fun with generosity, shouldn't we? We should have fun with generosity. I remember the one night, also, my wife and I were out for dinner, and the Lord put a, put a sum in my heart, a sum in my mind to give the waitress, and it was already a big amount. And so I slapped it with a card, and I gave it to her, and she was so overwhelmed. I was walking out the restaurant, and the Lord said, you know what, I want you to go back and give her another 500 bucks. And I said, I'm, 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 and I went back, and I said, the Lord's not done yet. He has another. So she was impressed with the first amount. With the second amount, she was even more impressed. Why? Just having fun. Hold Lucy to the things of this world. Bless someone, be generous. That's what the New Testament church was like. So if you want some of these cards, keep them in your wallet and just go out and bless someone. Now, as a church, we have fun with generosity. So I wanna give you just a few things that this church does every year. Now, this is gonna blow your mind and I don't know if you're all aware of this, but do you know that Christian Family Church almost gives one million rand per month to the various benevolent works and aid to different sorts of organizations as far as church planting is concerned. So I'm gonna run through some of these things with you because you are members of this church. You guys back the vision of this church and that is to bring people into the family of Jesus Christ, develop them to spiritual maturity, equip them for their work in the ministry in order to magnify God's name. You believe in the vision. You sow towards this vision. Now you may not know the impact that you are having. But let me tell you where your seed is going. Number one, we feed over 600 families a year with food parcels. Number two, we feed two and a half thousand homeless people every single year. Number three, we, pro we provide 500 homeless people with ponchos every year. We have homeless blankets for 500 people. We have a school feeding scheme for 200 students every single year we feed them. We give to orphanages every year. Teenage girls and abused women, shelters, Aged, we put on a big splash for all of our pensioners here at CFC. We even give to the SPCA. We even care for people's pets. 1,000 orphans are hosted at a Christmas party in various locations in Johannesburg every single year that costs this ministry over 150,000 rand. We give towards these works. You give towards these works. Are we having fun with generosity here? Are we having fun? Hang on, it doesn't stop there. Guess what? We do box of successes, which is school stationery that goes to, that goes to students that can't afford st school stationery. We serve our city. We have serve days. Just this year alone, we have given over 500,000 rand to three fix-up projects where people's homes were burnt and destroyed, where they were illivable. They didn't have furniture. You gave half a million rand to make sure that people are comfortable. Are we having fun with our giving yet? Are we having fun with generosity? If you don't know what to do with your money, if you don't know what to do with the extra cash that you've got, I can promise you now, you give it to Christian Family Church, we'll make sure it gets to the right people. Listen, beyond that, other special projects include blessing our firemen and our polices. We give to different kinds of causes, tens of thousands of rand every year. Besides that, we do local missions. We do national missions work. 
We do international missions work. We do international Bible college planting. And beyond that, we even have a bursary program for those students that can't afford Bible college. Your money is paying for pastors to be trained and sent out to the four corners of this world. Are we having fun with generosity yet? Amen. So the final way, and I need to speed it up. The final way, when I fall, how do I become a grace giver? Simply put, is when I fall in love with Jesus. When you fall in love with Jesus, you become a grace giver. In Psalm 116, verse 12, it says this. How can I repay, the psalmist says, how can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? We saw in Corinthians that they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to everyone else. Falling in love with Jesus first is the most important thing. John Bonnell put it this way. If one first gives himself to the Lord, all other giving is easy. If one gives himself first to the Lord, now you've heard, if you've been in this church for a while, you've heard this testimony that I've shared before. But I remember clearly, in actual fact, how many of you have been asked the question, I've been asked the question, Pastor Andre, I wish I had your love for Jesus. I wish I had your love for missions. I wish I had your love for the word. I wish I had your love for this. And, and you know, I've been asked that question so many times. People saying, I wish I had your passion for this. And, and, a, and a verse popped into my mind years ago when this question was asked me. And this verse is found in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. Look at what it says over here. It says this, for where your treasure is, there your heart is will be also. So my question to you tonight is this, and my question to all those people that have asked me that question is this, where do you want your heart? Because generosity leads, the heart follows. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If you want to be passionate about something, make sure your money goes there. I shared that illustration last week with Jose Manuela Gouveia Portela. Do you remember? Jose Manuela Guver Portela was a Portuguese guy next to me that wanted to spend all his money on a car. The very first thing on my budget, he was sitting next to me, the very first thing on my budget was my tithes and my offerings. Why? Because generosity leads, the heart follows. Generosity leads, the heart follows. As a 13-year-old man, I remember, and I'm going to close with this. I spent my entire December wrapping presents at the hub in Amanzimtoti. The most amount of money that I ever managed to save up by wrapping presents was 143 rand. I'll never forget it. How do I remember that it was 143 rand? Because God did it take every ounce of faith that I had to get into church that Sunday and be compelled and, and arrested and convicted by the Holy Spirit to tithe 14 rand 30 cents. I remember the 143 rand by writing on that envelope 14 rand and 30 cents. I wrote on that tithing envelope. I was 13 years old, between 12 and 13 years old, and I wrote that thing on that envelope. Let me tell you, folks, it was 13 years old I decided that generosity will lead and my heart will follow. And my heart has always been for the kingdom of God. I've got to the point where the largest tithing check I've ever had to write that I've been blessed to be able to write out was nearly 150,000 rand. Nearly 150,000 rand. Let me tell you, I broke the back of poverty as a 13-year-old boy that wrote out his first tithe check for 14 rand and 30 cents. Listen to me tonight. If you're saying, my heart may not be there, the Bible says, if you sow your seed, put your money where you want your heart to go. That's what it says. We'll read it in closing, and then we can bow our heads. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Your treasure doesn't go where your heart is. Your heart goes where your treasure is. So as I close this off, I'm going to ask every head to be bowed and every eye to be closed, folks. Short two-part series, encouraging us and stirring us to be generous. And the truth is, God ultimately is our example of what generosity should look like in the sense that He gave Jesus. The Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten son. God gave his best as an act of generosity towards a creation that didn't love him, that was not pursuing him, and there would be no guarantee that they ever would. God still in that moment was exceedingly generous. And so knowing that, I'm asking you here tonight, if you've not made Jesus your personal Lord and Savior, if you've not come to him and said, Lord, I accept the generous gift in Christ, 
that enables me to become a citizen of heaven and a child of God, that through praying this prayer and accepting Christ removes all the selfishness out of my heart and replaces it with the generosity of God. You can't change without Jesus. If you could change without Jesus, you would never need him. So if you are here tonight and Jesus is not your Lord and Savior, I'm not gonna embarrass you. I'm not gonna ask you to come to the front. I'm not gonna come to where you're at. But if you wanna make Jesus the Lord of your life tonight, if you wanna turn around, if you wanna become the kind of person that God destined you to be, if you wanna be forgiven of your sins, if you wanna start a new life tonight where everything you've ever done against God is forgotten and thrown into the sea of forgetfulness, I wanna pray with you. At the crown, count of three, raise your hand. One, two, three, raise your hand right in the air right now. I see those hands, God bless you. I see hands going up all over, God bless you. Please keep your hand raised. God bless you at the back there, hands over there. God bless you, sir. I see that hand over there. Anybody else? Raise your hand right now. We've got people that are just coming to agree with you in prayer tonight. God bless you. I see that hand over there. I see those hands at the back there. Once a hand has been placed on your shoulder, you can let your hand down. God bless you, sir. I see that hand right at the back there. God bless you. Now, for the benefit of those that raise their hands, I'm going to ask everyone, please, to pray this prayer after me. Everyone. Pray this prayer after me and let's say this together. Say, Heavenly Father. Let's start again. Say it together. Say, Heavenly Father. I come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner and I've missed your standard for my life. I have failed you time and time again. But tonight, I know there is hope in Jesus. He died for me. He paid the price for all my wrongdoing so that I could be forgiven. Tonight, I receive that forgiveness. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me. I promise to love you and to serve you until the day I meet you face to face. Take out my selfish heart and give me your generous heart so that I can make a change in my world for your glory. In Jesus' name. Now, while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I'm gonna ask you please to take the next step and stand up and go with that person that placed their hand on your shoulder to a place of prayer. We've got someone that just wants to spend five minutes with you. Take your belongings. We've got people there that are ready to pray with you if you need prayer. And so I'm gonna ask you please right now, let's take this next step. Come on, let's give them a warm congratulations and God bless you. This is why church exists, amen. Thank you for watching the Christian Family Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join our online community and join us live every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream and share this with your friends. Thank you again for watching and God bless you.